السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفى سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد Brothers and sisters, welcome to an episode number 119 in the series of Guardians of the Pious. Explaining still the 26th chapter, and that is the fourth episode in explaining the chapter. The chapter which is known as Tahrim of Zulmi Wal Amru Dirad al Mazalim, or the prohibition of oppression and the command of restoring others' rights. Inshallah, today we'll begin with. The hadith number 208. And this hadith is agreed upon its authenticity. It is collected by both Al Imam Al Bukhari and Al Imam Muslim. And it is narrated by the great companion Mu'ad ibn Jabal. رضي الله عنه. May Allah be pleased with him. And Mu'ad ibn Jabal رضي الله عنه قال بعثني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال إنك تأتي قوما من أهل الكتاب فادعهم إلى شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأني رسول الله فإنهم أطاعوا لذلك فأعلمهم أن الله قد افترض عليهم خمس صلوات في كل يوم وليلة فإنهم أطاعوا لذلك فأعلمهم أن الله قد افترض عليهم صدقة تؤخذ من أغنيائهم فترد على فقرائهم فإنهم أطاعوا لذلك فإياك وكرائم أموالهم واتق دعوة المظلوم فإنه ليس بينها وبين الله حجاب متفق عليه معاذ بن جبل May Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent him to Yemen as a governor. And he instructed him with the following instruction. He said, you will go to the people of the book, Ahlul Kitab, Jews and Christians. Then first call them to the shahada, to the kalima to testify to the oneness of Allah, that there is no true God except Allah, and that I am, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. If they obey you, tell them that Allah has enjoined upon them the five daily prayers. And if they obey you, inform them that Allah has made zakah obligatory upon them. That it should be collected from the rich and distributed among the poor. And if they obey you, then refrain from picking up the best of their wealth while collecting the share of the zakah. Then furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ said, and that is actually the reference in this hadith, and while Imam al-Nawawi listed this hadith in the chapter of Tahrim al-Zulm, the prohibition of oppression, because of this last statement, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Mu'ad ibn Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, beware of the supplication of the oppressed, for there is no barrier between it and Allah. This hadith has many great lessons that we should learn from this hadith. Number one, Mu'ad ibn Jabal is a great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu who was a mount of knowledge. With a great qira'ah and a great recitation, he used to lead the prayer at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu in a different masjid, of course. And Mu'ad ibn Jabal, once the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ya Mu'ad, inni uhibbuk, I love you. 
And what an honor. You know, all of us claim to love the Prophet وسلم, and some of us are true in their claim and some of us are not. We all dream to see the Prophet وسلم, even in a dream. We all dream to see the Prophet وسلم, in the hereafter. Look how eager are Muslims to go and visit his grave وسلم, and give the salam to him while standing before his grave. So just imagine the Nabi وسلم, is addressing a particular person and says to him, I love you. This is the highest level. I love you, that means Allah the Almighty also loves him. And Jibreel loves him and the angels love him. And we as the followers of the Prophet وسلم, we should love this companion innocently. Simply because the Prophet وسلم, has said to him, I love you. Because he would love him because he's cute or because he has wide eyes or narrow eyes or uh, pointed nose or because of the color of the hair or the complexion. No, because of his traits. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ أَجْسَامِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ Allah does not evaluate you based on your look, based on your body. Rather, he evaluates you based on your hearts. So when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says to Mu'adh ibn Jabal, I love you, that has the greatest significance. And he advised him that after every prayer, you should ask Allah the following dua. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. And because of that, we invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Oh Allah, help me to remember you, to be grateful to you, and to worship you properly. We learned that from Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu an. So on the 10th year after the migration, this is like a few months before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. He deployed Mu'adh ibn Jabal and he made him in charge of Yemen. He sent him to Al-Yemen to be the governor of Yemen, the southern of the peninsula. And subhanallah, and the dominant population of Al-Yemen were Ahlul Kitab. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam alerted him what kind of audience, what kind of people whom you're going to live with them, deal with them. And this is very important. Whenever you're asked to deliver a speech or give da'wah, you have to be aware of the background of the audience. Is he Christian? And if he's Christian, is he Catholic, Protestant, Unitarian, or Orthodox? And if he is Christian, is he practicing Christian or not? And is he a Jew? Is he a Hindu, a Buddhist, an atheist? So to know exactly the track which you're going to be taking and following in approaching the audience and what kind of speech you would choose for them. Similarly, the type of audience with regards to their mentality, with regards to their understanding, the level of understanding, if you're talking to a university students versus if you're talking to high school students or to professors or to doctors or to laymen. This is very important. We learn that from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He specified. He said, kitab. The people whom you're going to be with them and preach them and govern them are Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book. Whether they are following their book or not, they are called Ahlul Kitab. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a book to Moses, which is known as the Torah, and revealed a book to Jesus, peace be upon him, which is called the Gospel. Uh, whether they have altered it, whether they follow it, or they do not follow it, they are called Ahlul Kitab, despite the fact that they did all of that. They are not strictly following the guidance which Allah revealed to them in these books. Had they been following the guidance, they would have followed Abdullah ibn Salam and others and accepted Islam. But they changed their books. But they are still called Ahlu Kitab. What is the significance of that? The significance of that, all the ahkam, the rules and regulations pertaining to dealing with Ahlu Kitab are still effective. And since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they were called Ahlu Kitab, even though they were described in other ayat in the Quran as Ahlu Kitab, but as non-believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَقَدِ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَ Those who have said Allah is one of three or the third of three are non-believers. كَفَرَ Disbelieved. 
And also said, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بِنُ مَرْيَمُ So the ahkam applies to them ever since the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have been sent and declared his message and they disbelieved in him, they're called non-believers. They are believers in a sense that they believed in whatever they believe in, whether it is true or false. Okay, but to us, that they don't believe in the oneness of Allah, they don't believe in the message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how are you going to approach them? This is a lesson, this is what we call it, the alphabet. You know, if you're teaching uh, a KG uh, student how to read and how to write and all of that and the letters, big letters, this is the beginning. This is like breaking the ground in giving da'wah. Let be the first thing that you should invite them to is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Refresh their memory. Bring them back to the essence of the message of Moses and the message of Isa alayhi salam. Right? So that explains where many of us while giving da'wah actually go wrong. Whenever we are involved in interfaith dialogue, or in having an opportunity to address any type of audience in the West, for instance, in a church, in a synagogue, in a gathering at the university, that we get stuck in, in discussing fine details which only concern the believers, concern Muslims. The number of prayers we offer every day, the number of rak'ahs, how many days we fast, and the exact time, and the details of fasting, the detail of the zakah and hajj and all of that, it only concerns whom? The believers. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, begin by approaching them as follows. Teach them that there is no God to be worshipped but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And I am his last messenger. فَإِنْ هُمْ أَجَابُوكَ لِذَلِكَ If they comply with that, then bring the next most important aspect, which is worship. So number one is monotheism. Number one is tawheed. Then فَإِنْ هُمْ أَجَابُوكَ لِذَلِكَ The meaning of أَجَابُوكَ لِذَلِكَ If they accept that, if their reply is positive, if they testify to the oneness of Allah and that they believe that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the last messenger of Allah, then they're ready to know what kind of ordainment that Allah the Almighty has ordained upon them. He said, Khamsa salawatin fi kulli yawmin walayla, the five prayers in every day and night. And this statement is also used in the fiqh as a mean of explaining that there is no other mandatory prayer other than the five daily prayers. Zuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr. That's it. What about which? Well, according to the hadith, it is not a wajib. Well, Mu'ad ibn Jabal heard from the Prophet وسلم, that he should convey the following message. What Allah has ordained upon Muslims as obligatory as far as the prayer is those five daily prayers. And when I say that which duha prayer, emphatic and non-emphatic sunan, are not wajib, are not mandatory, are not belittling any of them. I'm just stating the fact that this is the fard namaz. This is the fard prayer. Then the rest is either emphatic or non-emphatic sunan. The scholars also have different opinions with regards to the Eid prayer, the Kusuf prayer, whether it's wajib or sunnah. But the five daily prayers is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained on the believers as a wajib, as a fard prayer, it must be offered. If you offer the five daily prayers and you don't offer any nawafil, you're fine. But you're fine in what sense? You're not blameworthy. But you're missing, of course, a great reward. And you're missing making up any drawbacks that may take place in the fard. And I can assure you, I myself have plenty of forgetfulness and absent-minded uh, conditions in the prayer. We dream and we think about a lot of things and we're not attentive in most of our prayer. So, a nafl or the non-emphatic and the emphatic sunan and, and, and all the nawafil would come to complete and make up the drawback and the, the deficiency which took place in the fard. So we stated that the fard, namaz, are the five daily prayers only.
And that also is explained in the other hadith of uh, the Badwin who said, O oh Muhammad, tell me what Allah has ordained on me. So he said five daily prayers, illa an tatawwa. Unless if you want to pray extra, yani nawafil, voluntary prayers. Okay. And that also shows the most important act of worship in Islam is the prayer because it was listed and it's mentioned right after declaring the oneness of Allah and recognizing the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Then what is next? فَإِنْهُمْ أَجَبُوكَ لِذَلِكَ Ah, so the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching Mu'adh the gradual process of inviting people to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not throwing the book at a person and saying, look, if you would like to become a believer, you have to understand that you would really suffer. You would have to fast five times a day. You would have to pray five times a day. In addition to there is a night prayer and there is a prayer in between. And you know what? You cannot work while the Friday prayer is being offered. It's haram. And you have to fast. You cannot eat. You cannot drink. You cannot satisfy your sexual desire for the whole day. And this is for a whole month. And you also will have to take out of your money. It depends on the way you present your da'wah. It depends on how you present your da'wah. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّ مِنْكُمْ مُنَفِّرِينَ Repellers would ward people off from listening to the deen. And others are attractive. You know, their speech, the way, the way you listen to them. If, if, if they are asking people to raise funds, to build a masjid, to build a school, or to treat a Muslim person in the community, the way they approach them, the way they mention and they list the hadith to encourage them to give in a charity would make people are willing to donate generously. And some people don't have, would even borrow in order to participate in doing what is good. So number one, at tawheed number two is as-salah, the five daily prayers. And number two, he said, فَإِنْهُمْ أَجَابُوكَ لِذَلِكَ If they comply with that, then inform them about the following message, which is as zakah He said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, that inform them that Allah has made zakah obligatory upon them. How? Who should pay the zakah? And to be paid to whom? And who's going to manage this whole process? That should be collected from the rich. And who determines what is rich and whom? And who is rich and who is poor? There is something called nisab. And nisab is the minimum amount which if you maintain for a whole lunar year, extra, beyond your basic needs, then you are rich enough and uh, you are required to pay zakah 2.5% for instance on your saving or your investment. To whom? تُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ وَتُرَدُّ فِي فُقَرَائِهِمْ And to be paid and to be given and to be the word to rad, to be returned. To whom? To be distributed among the poor. Their poor. Also the fuqaha, the Muslim Jews, benefited a great deal from this statement that the zakah which is collected from one locality should be paid in that locality to its poor people. And it is not permissible to transfer the zakah fund to another place without a need, without necessity, such as necessity, such as if there is another Muslim locality which is devastated with a natural disaster, with a war, with, with a disease, and they are desperately in need for fund. In this case, it is permissible to transfer the fund in order to rescue the devastated city. Also, Sometimes we look around if you're living in a rich country, in a rich city, you look around and everyone is rich. There are no poor Muslims. And as zakah must be paid only to Muslims. Versus the voluntary charity where you can pay to Muslims and non-Muslims as well. So when you look around, you can't find any poor people. What are you going to do with it? Can I send it back home? Or can I send it to devastated Muslim countries or poor Muslim societies? Not necessarily devastated because we don't have any needy people. Yes, in this case, that is permissible. And they have done that a lot during the Khulafa and during their successors. Because this is your ummah, one single united ummah. But 
what is the wisdom behind collecting the zakah from the rich and the recommendation as a command it must be returned and distributed among the poor people of the same locality city town village why we mentioned before one of the great wisdoms behind the mandate and the prescription of a zakah is to eliminate the evil eye the envy from the society we have rich people and we have poor people when the poor look at the rich living a lavish life it's from halal no problem but also they look at them while they're suffering so when the rich helps out the poor and when the rich assist the poor and when the rich knows that there is a certain right حق في أموالهم حق معلوم للسائل والمحروم as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said والذين في أموالهم حق that is in Surah al majid and Surah al muminun It is not a favor that you're doing to the poor. Rather, it's his haqq. It is their right in your wealth. Okay? So when this happens, and when the poor collect their hukuk, and it suffices their basic needs, and maybe even a little extra, if somebody is in need more than others, if somebody is in need for an operation, his daughter is getting married or whatever, that creates harmony in the society. And no one feels superior to others that I am doing you a favor. No, you're just fulfilling your duty and I'm collecting my right. Yes, you have an excellent word because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the upper hand is better than the lower hand. The one which gives is better than the one which receives before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But it doesn't mean that you should remind me with the favor that you did me. We learn all of that, subhanAllah, from the segment of inform them that Allah has ordained an obligatory zakah upon the rich people to be taken from the rich and to be returned and distributed amongst their poor. What if they obey you? Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. In qadu fa inhum ata'u li thalika. Then the Imam was responsible for collecting the zakah fund. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, make sure that you do not collect the share of the zakah from the best of their wealth. Why? Collect it from the average, not from the worst, nor from the best. Refrain from picking up the share of the zakah from the best of their wealth. And if you do, they may get angry with you. Yes, you are a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. But if you wrong anyone, this person has only one shelter to resort to. That is Allah. So Al-Mazlum or the oppressed one, once he faces heaven and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take revenge for him, if he is truly oppressed, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned against this condition by saying, وَاتَّقِ دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٌ And furthermore, with the meaning of this last phrase, inshallah to be continued after the short break, please stay tuned. Allah, Habib Allah, Rasul Allah, Habib Allah. من اللهو ومن التجارة والله رسول الله حبيب الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back the last phase in this beautiful hadith which is a cornerstone in دعوة and in فقه and in in many fields of the sciences of the deen is with regards to Beware of the invocation, the supplication of the oppressed. If you oppress anyone and he doesn't have the power nor the capacity to take avenge from you, then if he resorts to Allah and if he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take his right and to restore his right from you, you're in trouble. You are indeed in big trouble. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there is no barrier between this supplication 
and Allah. It goes straight to heaven. And guess what? Even if this supplication of an oppressed one is a supplication of a non-believer, even if the one who oppressed him is a believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not close the doors of the heavens again is the supplication of the oppressed even if he is a non-believer so you gotta be very careful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 148 chapter number 4 of the Quran this is surah Nisa لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم وكان الله سميعا عليما Allah does not like one should reveal the evil that he was uh, whatever evil of the statement except one who has been oppressed he's allowed to reveal that he's allowed to reveal it to Allah he's allowed to complain to the governors and to those who are in a charge and if they don't bring his right then Allah the Almighty will Allah is ever hearing ever knowing Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhum said the meaning of this ayah 148 of Surah An-Nisa la yuhibbu Allahu al-jahra bis-su'i min al-qawli means that no one should pray against another you should not pray against another person except if he oppressed you except if you have been oppressed and you have been wrong that is the meaning of Allah does not like people to pray against each other except only the oppressed may pray against his oppressor. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to restore his right or to punish his oppressor. Same thing was mentioned in the tafsir of Al-Imam Al-Sa'di. May Allah have mercy on him. If you're oppressed, you're allowed to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish your oppressor. Because imagine that is your only relief. That is your only hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when somebody says no 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 you're not allowed to pray against the oppressors we have references from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which show that it is permissible well if you pardon if you forgive that is greater and this is a sign of being a very righteous man and increased piety and all of that but it is your right to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, those who are destroying our houses, demolishing our neighborhood and robbing people, killing people, jailing people without any right, killing people. Don't you think that the oppressed ones have all the right to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish their oppressors? Yes. Al-Imam Muslim collected in his sound collection a hadith uh, from Urwa, from his father. He said that a woman by the name Arwa bin Tuwais claimed that Saeed ibn Zaid have taken a piece of her property, a piece of her land, like his land, his lot is next door to hers. So he uh, took with that right, this is what she claimed, a piece of her land, and he added it to his. So she complained to whom? The Khalifa back then is Marwan ibn al-Hakam, one of the Umayyad's uh, caliphs, Marwan ibn al-Hakam. فَقَالَ سعيد, سَعِيد ibn Zayd, May Allah be pleased with him. He said, Have I taken any piece of her land, even a hand span? May this and this happen to me. How could I take a piece of her land without any right? After what I heard from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that whoever takes without right a hand span of property or land, it will come on the Day of Judgment as a caller with the depths of seven earths. Seven earth min sabi ardin. We talked about this hadith before. How could I do that? So Marwan al Hakam said, Well, the case is dismissed. The guy is the one who's narrating the hadith. So he knows better. How could he take a property? Furthermore, Sa'id ibn Zaid was in quiet. He said, Oh Allah, if this woman is lying against me and making up this claim, Oh Allah, afflict her with two things make her blind and make her die in her land, in her property. Would she claim that I took a piece of her without any right? So subhanallah, she lost her sight. And while she was walking in her land as blind, she fell in a pit and she died as a result of that. Another incident happened with Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, 
قالوا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم and the first one to throw or to shoot an arrow in Islam jihad and مستجاب الدعوة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم asked Allah to make the invocation of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas to be accepted and he is one of the ten heaven bound companions Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas may Allah be pleased with him was a governor in Iraq and subhanallah some people made some false claims against him so he prayed against this person some awful awful invocation because he actually uh, accused him with bad and false accusations and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas may Allah be pleased with him so there are many indications in this regard provided what you truly have been oppressed so praying again as oppressor is something that is mentioned in the Quran and it's something mentioned in the Sunnah and uh, why do we need any further reference while the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyallahu an whom he said to him Ya Mu'ad inni uhibbuk I love you yet he said to him in another incident in this hadith اتقي دعوة المظلوم beware of the invocation of the oppressed make sure that you would not oppress anyone knowingly or unknowingly lest this person may invoke Allah against you and there is no barrier between the invocation of the oppressed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sa'id ibn Jubayr the great tabi'i prayed against Al-Hajjaj the criminal leader of this ummah and subhanallah later he was not able to hurt or harm anyone after Sa'id ibn Jubayr rather he himself was tortured in his sleep until he died because of the effect of the invocation of the oppressed of Sa'id ibn Jubayr radiallahu anh we learn from this hadith brothers and sisters many lessons number one it is the duty of the Muslim rulers to send to delegate and deploy ad dua all over the world it is their duty this is what the Prophet sallallahu did and this is what they should be doing and sponsor them financially, sponsor them by providing them with the proper means, da'wah materials in order to inform people about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Muslim ruler and every Muslim country is responsible for that. And if they do not fulfill this responsibility, they are indeed blameworthy. So what do we see? What we see is entirely the opposite that the, the, the dua, the preachers are being oppressed in their Muslim countries more than in the non-Muslim countries. And they hinder them from their da'wah, they put a lot of obstacles on their way, and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring guidance to our hearts and the hearts of our rulers. Allahumma ameen. Number two, whoever is in a charge of sending a dua, the preachers and the missionaries should inform them about the nature of the audience. You know, when you're going to Africa is versus to when you're going to Europe is versus and in Europe itself, each locality has different, you know, nature, different traditions. You have to be aware of the lifestyle of what you should be talking about and what should be postponed. It is not the right time to talk about it. Ahwal on nas, the condition of people, this is very, very important. Um you remember and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man came to him and, uh, and said, a young man and said, Ya Rasulullah, اِذَن لِي فِي الزِّنَا Allow me to commit adultery because I cannot resist my lust and I cannot fulfill it in halal. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he saw the companions were about to get this guy and punish him, beat him or whatever, he said, Udnu, come close. And he asked him, أترضاه لأمك أترضاه لخالتك أترضاه لعمتك أترضاه لابنتك Would you like it? Would you like people to commit adultery with your mother? With your sister? With your wife? With your daughter? With your aunt? And every time said No, 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 no way, no way لا والذي بعثك بالحق No, of course not I swear to the one who sent you the truth Okay You acknowledge this fact Well, similarly people do not like it For their mothers, their sisters, their aunts, their wives, their daughters And so on and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed for him and he said afterward there was nothing more hated to my heart than the fahisha of adultery. In the States, when I had a similar condition 
something close to it. And I was talking to this young man, يعني, would you like your sister to have a boyfriend? He said, I don't care. He said, your mother, he said, who cares? She has the right to do whatever she wants to do. And I'm talking about Muslims in a Muslim family. So of course, you have to understand the society is different. The time is different. The, the culture is entirely different. Each culture has its own approach. And it's all available in our da'wah methodology by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, that what we call people to. Number one, the foremost and the most important is at tawheed How good is it to spend an hour talking about worship in Islam or the financial system in Islam and the prohibition of gambling, the prohibition of drinking, the prohibition of having a boyfriend and girlfriend, the prohibition of dating, the prohibition of wearing gold for men, the prohibition of riba, the prohibition of bribery. Uh, well, people are living in this day and night for one single, one simple uh, question I would like to present which is why would they give up on all of that? Why would they change? Why would one who's anxiously waiting for the weekend to drink and have a, a, to date a girl, to go out and to gamble and to do all of that? Tell me one reason. Why should he quit? There's only one reason which is recognizing Allah, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the cornerstone and this is the main pole of the deen and that is the most important thing that we should Bring people to recognize the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we talk about the mandates, we talk about it as how we feel it when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not as heavy duties. Heavy duties that we are burdened to do. We're not burdened whenever we worship. We're not burdened whenever we offer the five daily prayers. You know who is burdened? You know who is depressed? You know who take their lives? You know, who actually living in misery, those who are not connected to Allah, in touch with Allah, communicating with Allah on a regular basis. But those who actually pray on a regular basis and receive this power and energy of the prayer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once they're connected to Him in salah, in every prayer, they don't have this problem. And I believe I mentioned to you before, when I have a group of European youth who came to learn about Islam, they were actually political activists. And every prayer, I took them with me to the masjid because I couldn't leave them home alone. And after a couple prayers, one of them said, do you guys have to do this every day? I said, it's not only once or twice, it's five times a day. But guess what? We do it because we love it. It is like power supply. It provides us with energy. It gives us self-esteem. It makes us feel much better because we are connected to Allah. We go to the masjid and we attend the prayer to increase our faith, our spirituality, our morals, and to feel better. Next time, as we will live in the masjid, he said, Muhammad, you know what? You know what you mentioned earlier? I feel the same. And he's a non-Muslim sitting on the chair in the rear row watching us while praying and this is something actually in the prayer then when we come to speak about the the fasting we bring first the wisdom behind fasting and there are many of them Allah mentioned at taqwa for instance and how to achieve this taqwa and how to feel the suffering of the poor and the needy you know there are a lot of people who go for diet an extreme diet that even deteriorate their health in order to lose weight it is not about losing weight here. It is about maintaining this powerful, strong tie between you and Allah. It is about increasing your faith and being righteous. It is about feeling the need of the poor and the needy ones. And that's why Allah says that if you cannot fast, what is the alternative? You say it. You know it. Huh? You cannot fast? Give a poor person a meal to break his or her fast on or if they're not fasting, to eat. So mission is accomplished through another mean, which is the ransom, which is the, the fidya. A zakah, likewise. And we explain the difference between a zakah, which you pay willingly, 
versus Uncle Sam's tax, which you're trying to cover, conceal, and find a good account in order to cover up some earning. Now, this is something that you do with happiness. You do because it increases your wealth. And you keep talking about the privilege of paying zakah and furthermore paying extra charity. Privilege? Yes. you privilege to know that when paying in a charity, when giving in a charity, it brings you closer to Allah and Allah puts barakah and blessing in your wealth. al hasanatu bi ashri amthaliha. And you can drive as many examples as possible. I know I did really take a lot of time explaining this hadith, even though we were only concerned with the last segment of the hadith concerning a dhulm. But this is like one of the most important hadith, especially concerning the method, the methodology of giving da'wah. How to approach non-Muslims. How to approach even Muslims who are not practicing Islam. With the mandates, with do's and do not do's. Trust me, brothers and sisters, that one day, I cannot forget this incident. When one day in Houston, Texas, I met this uh, American revert who used to think I'm a revert myself. So we got to know each other and we chatted. And he told me that he's a New Yorker. And he said that he used to go to the nightclub on a regular basis, sometimes even every night. He's an engineer, successful in his career. And he said to me literally, you know, Muhammad, I couldn't imagine myself quitting this habit because I enjoyed it. I enjoyed drinking. I enjoyed hanging around with girls, uh, you know, every week with a different girl and having fun. I was living my life. If anyone would ever tell me that I would quit all of that, I would quit drinking, gambling, and quit, you know, having a relationship with girls and dating and smoking and all of that, I would say you're crazy. He said, you know what? Wallahi. My best fun and what I enjoy most and what I could never imagine that one day I can quit is after finishing work, I can't wait to come to the masjid to pray Maghrib, then stay in the masjid until Isha. If there is a khatara, if there is das, or I chat with the brothers, I learn something new, I feel peace of mind. The coolness of my eye is in this place. This shift, this transition, this change, was not all of a sudden, brothers and sisters. It was not because we picked them up from the night club and say, come and try a better fun. You stop having a relationship with girls, you stop drinking, and I'm going to give you a better alternative, which is what? Pray and listen to a speech or listen to the Quran. This transition happened through a period of time after establishing this powerful bond between the servant and his creator. When you know what you're doing, what you're doing, it becomes affordable. It becomes easy. It becomes fun because you enjoy it. So we learn from this hadith a lot of lessons as I uh, mentioned uh, earlier. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand his deen and most importantly to avoid oppression and avoid the invocation of the oppressed ones. أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم and until next episode I leave you in the care of Allah والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest Alone and only glory to Him He only humans to be the best And give His best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest Alone and only glory to Him He only humans to be the best And give His best religion to them So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about Him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price